When it came to what would be regarded as classic albums, we were spoilt for choice during the summer of 1966. The UK album chart for August that year reflected my teenage listening tastes and those of many others at the time. There were some great yet diverse albums which were being played that summer. Even old favourites such as The Beatles, Beach Boys and The Stones seemed to be either changing direction, up in their game or both. The Beatles' revolver naturally occupied the number one chart position. The Fab's latest album contained the usual pretty songs, but a change in musical direction could be heard, and a psychedelic taste of things to come. On the album's last track, Tomorrow Never Knows. The Beach Boys were changing directions too. When the group returned from their tour of Japan, they discovered their leader, Brian Wilson, had been recording pet sounds. Gone were the band's typical surfing songs, which were now replaced by introspective and semi-autobiographical coming-of-age songs sung against Wilson's wall of sound-based orchestrations. With the release of Aftermath, the Stones produced their first album to comprise original self-penned songs, some of which were mainly misogynistic attacks on Mick Jagger's former girlfriend, Chrissy Shrimpton the sister of model Jean Shrimpton, the face of the 60s. So no Moon in June love songs for teenage adolescent girls to swoon over here. The Small Faces' debut album catered for the mod subculture with its r and b tinged tastes. John Mayall's Blues Breakers with Eric Clapton, the album commonly known as The Beano, led the way for the British blues band and we'd all eventually get a touch of those Fleetwood Mac, Chicken Shack, John Mayo Can't Fail Blues. I ought to include Bob Dylan's Blonde on Blonde newly released double album for completeness, which wasn't an album or an artist that I could relate to at the time. For balance, I should mention that regardless of what albums teenagers helped make the charts, the soundtrack of the film The Sound of Music was the best-selling album in the United Kingdom in 1965, 1966 and 1968 thanks to people like my auntie and it was the second best-selling album of the decade spending a total of 70 weeks at number one on the UK album charts Needless to say, The Sound of Music didn't sound like The Sound of Music to my ears but at least not decent music So with all this change and arguably great music going on, was there really any room or any need for yet another teeny bopper band? I didn't think so, but someone clearly did. It was obvious then, as it is now, that the Monkeys were created for the younger siblings of Beatles fans. TV producer Bert Schneider and director Bob Raffleson saw the Beatles' success in the US cinemas for their 1964 A Hard Day's Night movie and sensed an opportunity for a TV series, albeit two years later, that followed on in the Hard Day's Night format. They avoided featuring a successful group, but instead opted for a storyline that involved a struggling act that can't get a break, can't pay the rent and will play any gig. Subsequently, Raffleson and Schneider posted an ad in the entertainment press which looked for folk and rock musicians singers for acting roles in a new TV series etc It's not unusual for actors or musicians to apply for vacancies advertised in the entertainment press Equally it's not unusual for singers and musicians to try their hand at acting and vice versa although it doesn't always translate to them being equally good at both. I'm using the term acting loosely here. Just because a singer starred in a film in a role that required dialogue doesn't mean they're up to performing Shakespeare, which anyone who has seen any of Elvis Presley's films will vouch for. Not every band is organic. The Beatles may have come from the same town, 
and known each other since their teenage days. But ultimately it was a management decision when it came to the sacking of drummer Pete Best and hiring of Ringo Starr as a permanent member. It wasn't the first time, nor the last, that original band members were to be given the push because their faces didn't fit. Even my then beloved mod band, The Small Faces, fired their founder member, actor and keyboard player Jimmy Winston, and replaced him with Ian McLagan. That's before I had even got to see what the band looked like. Perhaps he was too tall to be a small face. A face being a top mod and one to look up to, or down to if he's one of the small faces. It was also a management decision regarding who became a member of the Monkees and who didn't. According to Dave McGowan, author of Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, Stephen Stills, who later became a member of the West Coast counterculture band Crosby, Stills and Nash, also applied for the Monkees gig, but was rejected because of the condition of his teeth. Well, they look all right to me, Stephen. Finally, as we all know, actor-musician Mickey Dolenz, British singer, stage actor Davy Jones, recording artist, songwriter Michael Nesbitt, and Greenwich Village folk musician Peter Talk were selected to become the Monkeys. Mm-hmm. 